Okay. So uh, this was a story of a 50 years female with a history of hypertension, non-diabetic, presented to us with the acute onset right hemiplegia and uh, dysarthria and facial droop. Sorry, it was a left hemiplegia, uh, dysarthria and facial droop around 6 p.m. Uh, NHS was around 12. She presented to ER around 8.30 p.m. So onset to arrival was around 2 hours, 30 minutes. And uh, this was the CT at onset. So uh, I think you can see early ischemic changes here, periselvian area, M1, and like uh, here also you can see M4 and uh, dense, hyperdense MCA sign also you can see here. So when uh, we saw this CT, uh, first thing we, what we did, I like we, we get back to the family members and we wanted to be sure that whatever time they told is uh, correct or not because we can uh, see almost early ischemic changes uh, well, if uh, like uh, very clearly visible so we want to be very sure at the same time family members said that they are sure that this happened around 6 pm because before that she went to washroom and then came back so we thought like probably they are telling it correctly so uh, early ischemic changes was right M2, M4 and periselvian area. So we estimated aspects around 6 to 7 and there was hyperdense MCA sign. There was old right parahippocampal area also there was a hypodensity. So probably an old infarct. However, when we inquired, they were not very sure. So we were not very sure that at that time that was symptomatic or not. So now the question was what to do, we can, a patient presented within therapeutic window, but we can already, already see uh, almost established changes uh, involving our, it's a moderate area of right MCA territory. So the question was whether we should go ahead with IV thrombolysis because the patient reached within therapeutic window. So it's two hour, 30 minutes. And then because there was a large vessel occlusion, so just doing IV thrombolysis and then uh, take the patient to cath ward and do the endovascular thrombectomy because we know that uh, with MCA, the chance of recanalization is not more than 30 to 35 percent. Or we should do with endovascular thrombectomy alone because we can already see the early ischemic changes and we know that we are at this point of time at equipose, like whether we should do endovascular thrombectomy with IV thrombolysis or only endovascular thrombectomy. Or we need further investigation, despite knowing that patient's family are like sure that this happened around 6 p.m. So, because our uh, CT console is very nearby MRI, and because we could see the early ischemic changes which are almost established, so we thought to give a, a sort so that we can see whether uh, in MRI, whether we can uh, see something which uh, because we were a little bit scared about if we do IV thrombolysis, then whether there's a chance of high chance of reperfusion bleed or not. So that, that this time we also discussed about endovascular thrombectomy with family, but uh, again, uh, family undecided at that, that point of time. So the options left with us was a go ahead with IV thrombolysis because patient was still in therapeutic window. Now, if deciding for IV thrombolysis, any preference of thrombolytic agent, LT plays versus uh, tenecti plays, or we should continue with conservative considering there is almost established changes in the right MCA area, or whether we can do further investigation to decide further course of action. As we said that uh, our CT scan is very near by MRI, so we thought that why don't we do a fast track MRI to get more idea about doing a uh, uh, like intravenous thrombolysis, uh, we opted uh, with uh, tenecti place because family is still uh, not decided about endovascular thrombectomy. So we thought we should, uh, if uh, like we see uh, like significant uh, diffusion flare mismatch or perfusion mismatch, diffusion perfusion mismatch, then we should go ahead with IV thrombolysis because family is still uh, not decided about endovascular thrombectomy and. Uh, we opted for tenecti place because now we know that EOSO guideline says that in a case of large vessel occlusion, uh, tenecti place is preferred over LT place. And now we have Canadian guideline also, which also recommends uh, almost in uh, all type of stroke 
like uh, as a alternative place as alternative to IT place. So now we again thought like what investigation may be uh, more helpful. So whether we should do CT angiography or not, which will give an idea about collaterals and all, or we should do a CT perfusion to see the uh, 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 like large area of perfusion so that we can get an idea that it still there is a large salvageable penumbra or we should do with MR perfusion or is a combination of ever. So we finally decided with MRI brain so that we can get uh, involvement of parenchyma diffusion flare mismatch along with diffusion perfusion mismatch along with top sequence. So this was the MRI at onset. So if you can uh, see the, remember the CT, so almost similar, you can uh, see here the perisylvian area M2 and M4 area already involved and they are a bit little early diffusion restriction in the basal ganglia region. And if you see the perfusion weighted images, uh, you can see there is a large uh, perfusion deficit. This was the perfusion area. So we can see here that uh, there is already diffusion restricted, which matches actually with CTS scan, but still there is a large perfusion area so that we can salvage a penumbra. So you can see here the flare, there were no uh, uh, established flare changes yet. You can see there is no flare changes and there was an old parahippocampal infarct which already we saw in the CT scan and this was the top sequence which corroborated with the CT hyperdense MCS sign. You can see here a monocclusion also here. So family uh, fam finally declined for endovascular thrombectomy considering uh, because they have financial constraint. So we decided to go ahead with IV thrombolysis because we can see a large perfusion deficit be thrombolyzed with tenicity place at around 9.20 p.m. So door to needle time was 50 minutes. So we got a little bit 10 minute, I will say 10, 15 minute delayed because of this MRI and MRI perfusion. One hour post IV thrombolysis, NIHS came down to 6 from 12. This was the uh, post around 24 hour post uh, thrombolysis CT scan. So you can see here the established changes which are almost matching with the uh, MRI. We already saw that in MRI also there was, when we did the MRI, there was already a early diffusion restriction in the basal ganglia region. And there was, uh, this was the follow-up CTA done at the same time. And you can see the complete recanalization. And you can see here the very good collaterals also. So ECO done was non-contributory. 48-hour halter showed uh, atrial fibrillation. We started him on uh, around epixaban 5 milligram twice daily on day 6 and discharge on day 7 with NIHS 4 and MRS 3. So now here uh, we thought like what we can discuss here is a bad looking CT brain is a contraindication for IV thrombolysis in, even in presence of large vessel occlusion where uh, like family yet not decided for endovascular thrombectomy or not agreed for endovascular thrombectomy and particularly in such type of CT scan, if family would have agreed for this endovascular thrombectomy, so whether we should prefer EVT alone over uh, like IV thrombolysis with EVT considering there is a little bit uh, increased risk of hemorrhagic conversion, particularly with aspect 7 or less. So we know that extensive and clear hypertenuation on baseline CT or extensive hyperdense DWI area on baseline MRI represent irreversibly damaged brain tissue and therefore in such cases IVT may be of limited value. Although the degree of extension of this systemic area that may render IVT futile or even harmful is not well known. And yes, for aspect 7 or less is associated with a little bit increased risk of ICH but that not that not makes a contraindication for IV thrombolysis. So here uh, in uh, our case, uh, the take home message was that ischemic changes in CTS can should not be the sole reason to decide against IV thrombolysis. And sometimes 
Higher investigation like CT angio, CT perfusion, or MRI with MR perfusion may be of helpful in deciding further course of action in such cases. Though there is no clear consensus about EVT with or without IV thrombolysis because we are still at equipers, it may be skipped in elderly patients who are in late phase of IV thrombolysis with high bleeding risk like extensive white matter ischemia or cerebral microblade. So here I rest the case. I want to discuss this case and want to get their opinion. Like first thing, uh, my question would be to them, uh, like what, or like in such situation, seeing the CT scan, if the MRI would have not been available in, in, in a such a center, what they would have done, whether they would have proceeded with IV thrombolysis alone or they would have uh, done something different and whether this where we did the MRI with MRI perfusion, whether they like to do some other investigation like CT NG or CT perfusion or they agreed that MRI with MR perfusion uh, is uh, like better in such situation. Okay. Binakshi, you would like to respond or Rahul? Sir, give me some time, sir. I have not been able to grasp that case I told you. Okay. Just now and it came back, sir. Sorry, sir. That's the case. I just sent for MRA right now, sir. I'll get back to you, sir. Sorry, no, sir, sir. No problem. So, Rahul, you would like to comment or you want me to comment first? Who? No. Uh, you also yeah. comment, sir. You can comment yeah. first. But my question is, um, I have a simple question. Suppose if you had done a uh, mismatch study, you know, you do, did a multimodal imaging and if it had shown that there was no mismatch, what would you have done? At two hours, patient has no mismatch. There's no uh, mismatch. Then still, will you thrombolize? Or because there's no mismatch, there's no point thrombolizing. You know, sometimes these multimodal things make the things more complicated than sometimes it'll yes. be. Especially in a situation where patient is presented within so-called window period. Window period. I, probably we tend to use more of multimodal imaging in patients who are extended window or maybe more of wake-ups. Because, you know, in sometimes in uh, uh, the window period, it makes us makes the life more difficult than making it happy or easy. So, sir, you would you like to start commenting? Yeah, right. So, uh, you see, the guidelines also say that uh, within window period, and window period now is 4.5 hours. Yeah? Within window period, there is no need of doing any multimodality. This is guideline. This is not, this is guideline. There may be mismatch, there may not be mismatch, but the guideline is that don't try to uh, waste your time in this. You thrombolize them anyway, which means some of them may be having mismatch, some of them may not be having mismatch. But as per guidelines, we can thrombolize and your patient is within 4.5 hours. So, uh, so that is, so, so that's as far as the extended imaging is concerned. It, after you cross 4.5, then because then you are basically crossing the deadline. Cross, then you have to worry whether you will, how will be the outcome because you, then you can do all that. In, in fact, you can give IV thrombolysis up to nine hours also. But then you have to show all these mismatch and all that. Mismatch, yes. Otherwise, up to 4.5 hours, I would not. I would have straight with thrombolysis. Now, coming to your CT scan versus uh, MRI. You see, CT scan, uh, two things CT scan shows. One is the depth of ischemia. Second is extent of ischemia. The extent of ischemia will be seen by whether one third of MCA is involved, whether subtle changes are there, whether two thirds is involved, whether entire. That will depend on where is the level of the block. Depth of the ischemia means it depends on the collaterals. That means how much black it is. So your patient has had a good depth of ischemia because within 2-3 hours it has become black. This happens yes. only in 5-10% of patients. In yes, yes. 90% of patients, CT scan up to 6 hours. Yes, yes. We, we cannot see any change. But yes. your patient, so this used to be, this, this would cause us some stress before. But 2019 guidelines are very friendly to neurology. 2019 guidelines says that when you are within window period, no degree of ischemia extent and no depth of the ischemia extent is a contraindicate. Yes. That means if your entire MCA is gone, still you are allowed to thrombolize. Outcome may not be good. You are very right. Outcome will not be good. That you have to tell family. But you are allowed to thrombolize. Similarly, uh, if you are... Uh, did, 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 it may previously they used to say if it is more than subtle hypodensity, don't thrombolize. But now they say whether it is totally black thing, it is very and it is involving whole of MCA, you can still thrombolize. Most, but you know, a particular family may ask you that what will be the outcome. That time you have to tell them the outcome may not be good, but you can still do it. So 
considering that data and guidelines this patient because his uh, hypodensity was there but it was almost one third not very much more yes, than yes. one third and yes. he was within window period i would have thrombolyzed him but at the same time i would have definitely done ct angio or mr angio to make sure whether he needs mechanical valve yes uh, so that is our that is our usual protocol yes. Yes, so we did in our, this case uh, uh, because it was available and uh, we wasted yes ten minutes extra because uh, we shifted from CT to MRI and we do fast track MRI. So that's so because uh, we actually saw the early ischemic change which was almost established. So we thought uh, like before doing at least we can get uh, an idea. That is okay. And, that is okay. yes. And then sir, again one thing I want to know like in such cases like because we know now like uh, IV thrombolysis. Uh, EVT with IV thrombolysis or EVT without IV thrombolysis is still are undecided and there are not significant difference. So in such cases where you see a uh, mm, uh, almost early significant early ischemic changes and in uh, like NGO whether it is MR NGO or CT NGO you see the large vessel occlusion. So whether you are comfortable with both or you prefer here in such cases EVT alone. So in this. Patient, the leukoaryosis is a risk factor for bleed, but it's not such a risk, such a big risk factor for bleed like yes. micro hemorrhages. They are a bigger risk factor for. It. So in this patient, I would go by the conventional thing. I would go by giving first IV thrombolysis and then giving because there are some advantages of giving IV thrombolysis yes. also because it softens the clot and all that thing. And if you see most of the data that shows that the outcome was better without significant increase in the hemorrhage. so i think in this patient i would uh, i would go by the conventional thing of bridging which means combining both there are some situations where i would do uh, iv i intra you know mechanical thrombectomy alone that would be in a patient where aptt is very high you know i i want to do that or you know for instance a cardioembolic stroke following a procedure patient is having a hemiplegia and there is a mca block and they have already received heparin and the aptt is like 44 or 45 in those patients i would do mechanical thrombectomy alone without doing uh, mm-hmm. without doing. but you know now the good thing is that the guidelines have shown the data is showing that there is some difference bridging is better but the difference is not that not much. significant yes, yes it is not that significant. significant so either way you can do either way whichever way you are comfortable so yeah. i think if you give the explanation that i was afraid of the leukoaryosis therefore i went with mechanical you will be absolutely justified and anybody yes, yes. will accept that Yes, yes. So that is one good thing that today it's in our court. Either way, we are comfortable. We, we can, can decide. We can like take the decision. Yes. That was this I have heard in an international meeting. Experts saying that you take your own call. Either way, you are. Yeah. yeah. Because it all depends like who are actually seeing. Because if intervention radiologists are, they prefer like we can do just a EVT fast EVT. No worry, not to do with not to take risk with any bleeder like that. But what happens, you know, as as Rahul said, as Rahul said very correctly, we always. Take a judgment which looks correct to us at the nick of the moment. That, yes, and it is yes. the next day when you know I should have done that. Now what yes. happens is that sometimes they are not able to pass through the clot, and then there is the first pass and second pass and third pass, third and therefore pass they will and... oh wish if I had given the IV TPA IV thrombolysis and then <laughs> yeah, yes, pro- yes, agree. Yeah, you know so or sometimes if you have done thrombol like in your case, you know uh, suppose if you have done mechanical. in this patient as you wanted to do you would have costed patient 10 times more yes 10 right? times more 10 times yes. more and there might have been a complication also a complication so, also. <laughs> because yes, one, of advan- one of the advantage one of the advantage of iv is that there is a 30 20 to 30% chance that you may get away with the mechanism right Direct, yes yes so and we advantage. have seen the canalization yeah. with large with even ica clot, clot we have seen the canalization with uh, IV thrombolysis, particularly if the so, reason. Yeah. So unless there is a compelling reason like this high APTT or patient crossing window period, I think uh, it is better to stick to the combo. Uh, Minakshi, uh, how is your patient doing? Minakshi, how is your patient? No sir. No sir. He has a bleed. Okay. Thank God. Thank God for that. <laughs> so you don't if, have to if, go. So if I. Sir, there is uh, a. Uh, yeah. There is a early ischemic change. What is the the original NIMS data said that you no know, these are some of the exclusion contraindications. Yes. Subsequent data said that whether they are there or not, overall the prognosis will be good if you treat. Again, in 2016 guidelines when they wrote, they said that extensive early ischemic changes we should not do. 
So there has been a constant source of confusion with regard to this data on the early ischemic changes. So how do they define it? They say that more than one third, then you should be careful. That word careful is very difficult for us to understand. Difficult, what yes, yes. After all, you are going to take it and just inject the drug that is all. How can you be more careful than just injecting into your vein? I really don't understand. So in our policy, what we do is that sir, within that three hour, four hour, four and a half hours window, particularly I never accept for an MRI because it has been more a source of confusion than other ways. I accept for MRI in our hospital in the four and a half hours window only if I am not sure it is a stroke. That is the only reason why I do it. Or I find it that maybe vaguely it may be stroke, but it may not be that case. Always routinely four and a half hours window. I think we just do CT, no bleed. Like CT and you some. It has been our policy. Even CT and you, we do it only after the CT. <laughs> Many times we just slice it and then do a CT and even that time we just save. That's what we have been. Our policy is four and a half hours or less, very simple for our residents. Do CT, no bleed, lice. Don't ask for the report of the scan also. This has been our policy. Okay. I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but it's what we have been practicing. Sir, is that correct, sir? Yes. Yeah. I agree, Min, actually. Our, our uh, indication for MR in window period only three or three and a half, I would say. First is if patient has seizure at onset, sometimes you are worried. So that's where we do MR. Second, as you correctly said, in mimics, probably we would do MR. And in some patient, if the sugars are extremely high or extremely low, maybe sometimes we have never done this as of now. It is just written in our protocol. And third is, as sir said, in a large stroke, sometimes we may have to give a patient uh, opinion that uh, the prognosis is going to be bad, though even if you're giving IV. So that is a plus minus. So that, these are our three and a half indications for doing MRI in first four and a half hours. Otherwise, whichever patient comes, it is always CT with CT and that's it. Yes, yes. Window, yes. yes. And as far as EVT only you're concerned, I would, we would do it in uh, as such, someone who is, you know, or someone who has re recently received an agent um, uh, which can be troublesome. So that's where probably only EVT. And secondly, in uh, patients, you know, when you're doing it after very long period, Suppose sometimes we know that in basilar you do it after 12 hours or maybe in 18 hours. That's where probably EVT. So EVT only only for the dose to indication. Otherwise, it is always IV followed by EVT. That's our usual protocol. Also, with connective place, one great advantage we had was earlier with alkyl place, we had to just run the infusion. And yes. I have found out that when you use the infusion pump, they will not take you to the MRI. Our infusion pump earlier was not compatible. Now we had to get one MR compatible one. Now with tenative place, that problem is solved. You just give one injection and just push them inside. The injection is often taken to the scan room to lice. Our MRI and CT are opposite each other. So we have a lot of advantage just pushing it and doing it. That's all. Yes. So Sadanan, if I ask you a question as um, if you have a case of LVO, a large vessel, will you always give tenecta plays or there are some patients where you are still using alteplays? In uh, sir, uh, now uh, we are frequently, we have switched completely to tenecta plays. Uh, particularly if there is a large vessel, they always prefer tenecta plays because now uh, it uh, made our life easy. When on phone, uh, we, we see the scan and say the resident like you uh, give the dose while we reach. So, we don't waste time. So, we always try to, sir, uh, thrombolize at in th within 30 minutes because that is the goal now. Yeah. So, yes, in our case, uh, it took a 10 minute extra. And I know that uh, even if like MRI was not available, we would have thrombolized because we uh, told family members that uh, he might have a little bit increased chance of bleed because there is already, but uh, it still benefit uh, outweighs the risk. But yes, sometimes because uh, when you are doing and if you um, MRI is available, it will take 10 minutes. We do fast track MRI, DWI, flare and top sequence. So that's why we did. But I agree completely that we should not uh, do uh, a routine MRI. We not required at all. We just do CT, start thrombolysis. And sometimes we do after that, we do either CT angio or MR angio. Because uh, earlier, what we used to do, we do CT and CT angio, but uh, CT angio again takes 15 minutes extra, 10 15 minutes extra. So that's why uh, we don't waste much time. Just do CT, no contraindication, thrombolize, and then do CT angio. If large vessel occlusion, uh, ready for uh, like cath lab with family activities. Sir, one more thing, sir. Our own practical experience is that the duration of time spent for counseling for IV thrombolysis is inversely proportional to the acceptance rate. Look at the cardiologists, they don't even see the patient. They just see the ECG and give injection, they don't even counsel. I have not seen a cardiologist sitting and counseling a person for IV thrombolysis talking about hemorrhage anymore. 
I think we should have a you know, thing to learn from them, too that we should explain. But I feel that many of us neurologists will keep on explaining to the patient about this, the bleed, 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 and ultimately lose the time. So I found out that whenever I have taken less time, I say that there is a stroke and we have to open the vessel, we have to give. Rest of the things we will see later. And there is a 6% chance of bleed. The acceptance rate is phenomenal. Then yes. sitting and spending too much time with them. I don't know what is your experience of the take call cells and brown cells experience. Less of the time we spend more than some because we are actually doing good. Why should we really, really feel sorry about it? We just we quickly we do it and take the decision. Is that one of our emergency resident? He did a thesis of breaking out a door to needle time, and he he was looking at whichever which was the step where maximum time was spent in the door to needle time. And we found that the maximum time, this was, of course, I'm talking about more than five years back. We found that the maximum time was spent was for consent. You know, the doing the CT scan, CT scan reading, uh, neurologist coming in time, everything was possible. Getting the injection was possible. The issue was, you know, talking about the consent. So we found that actually the bottom neck in our uh, this thing center was uh, this consent part. So now we are trying to start, um, uh, we are doing it as you correctly said. Simplified version, and fortunately now the awareness also is improved phenomenally among some, uh, at least in urban area. You know, the people are come for coming asking for uh, the so-called yes. injections. So you know, the awareness is improved definitely. So that time is becoming lesser and lesser. And now that because the drug has been a standard of care, actually we shouldn't be taking consent. You know, if you ask them to sign on something, that that means you're doing something which probably usually you don't do. So you don't take consent. You are giving aspirin. You know, it is a standard of care now. Uh, doing IV thrombolysis in a window period is actually uh, the standard, a, of care. standard of care. You take consent probably for something which is doing out of standard of care. So I think, I don't know whether we should continue taking this consent because it is a consent. If you ask the relative to sign, you know, that really creates sometimes havoc. They, they would like to call some doctor or some family member. You Everyone, agree. one of us has faced this. I don't know what's your opinion. Yeah, agreed, sir. Continue taking consent, especially when it is a standard of care now. How is that? If we don't take concern, if there is a bleed, we are in trouble, sir. So maybe you are, uh, you know, the big this one, sir. We are not. So they will beat us, <laughs> sir. Well, take concern, but tell them on the face. I tell them 6% chance of bleed and tell them, sir. And many times I ask them to take a video recording of me telling them that. So that increases their acceptance rate. I've always seen. You say, take a video, I'm going to talk to you. There is a stroke, I'm going to lie. Take a video, 6% chance of bleed. Even for dead face, they use the same six person. You go ahead and do it. They are always upset. Because they think that something has been recorded and this doctor cannot be at fault. Okay. But concern, without consent, difficult. I don't know, sir. All sir, is consent required, sir. Oh, you see, this consent thing we have debated for many years and we used to get so stressed by it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think now we have, uh, we have um, perfected this art of consenting. You know that you know, a simple injection can cause death of a patient. Simple injection by anaphylaxis can cause death of a patient. Similarly, when we do any operation, any routine operation, in the hospital, you have to take a consent from the patient. So we should not spend that much time. We, what we do now is that we don't give long lecture on the pathophysiology of stroke, which you used to do. We just tell him that, look, your, your, this thing it has a stroke, and the only treatment available at this time is this thing. And uh, please sign it here. There is a chance of bleed also. Invariably, they accept. It is a routine thing. It's a routine sentence which you have to talk like a parrot. Not too much of pathophysiology. Yes. Look, I am going out. This is the best which can be given at this time. And it's now only. There is a small chance of bleed. Even 6%. Why are you telling percentage? He is not a statistician. Tell him there is a small chance of bleed. Uh, but then benefit is much more than 99% success. They don't go into their themselves in stress at that time. They will accept anything that you want. I also agree with you, Minakshi. It's better to take consent even though Rahul says no. no I'm still because taking it, given, sir. I'm debating whether we should take it or not. No, no, I, think, I think it is better because, you see, out of your 100 patients, one patient is enough to cause uh, misery to you. Uh, you know, uh, there may be some uh, relative in US or somebody. and uh, they, You know, sometimes they may question your indications of giving it, whether it was a minor stroke. Whether it's better to take two lines and get it signed and get rid of sir, the tension. Sir, I learned from one, there is an anecdote, sir. There was a college professor from nearby. His daughter is from US, they brought to us, and that same James Bond time, five minutes to problems. So that time I remember, sir, I told them that this was my concern. I said, 
I am putting a gun on your head and I am telling you for your fun. You came with vernic surface like presentation. I don't know pure vernic surface here. The prognosis may not be really good in terms of aphasia, but this is the best. She said, no, 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 you have to sit and give an explanation. That's what they do in US. I said, I am not giving any explanation. Just take the explanation, record it now. I am giving you one minute to sign that I am going to give an injection. This is stroke and I am going to give an injection straight away. You accept 6% risk. You don't, I am leaving. She signed. I gave injection. Then we took a CD and then we sat and talked. It has worked. Minakshi, Minakshi, you, yes, you, you, yes, should not have been, you should not have been that rude to her. <laughs> same thing you could have said nicely no, also. <laughs> you could have said same no. thing. But you know, I have had, I have had, I have had to, as doctors, as long as we are practicing, we will get these problems every day. Tomorrow also you will get a US relative and he will be in the same. So we have to get used to it. I'll tell you two very mini anecdotes. One of it was a Andhra Pradesh, uh, <laughs> Andhra Pradesh uh, High Court judge's mother came with the NIHS of two, right? And uh, uh, naturally now two. So we were worried, should we thrombolize or not? Because mother is a judge. Tomorrow she may sue us and she's, she will sue and she is judge also. <laughs> <laughs> so should we give or not? Uh, if we if we if she progresses again a problem and if we have given it then we have uh, thrombolized a minor stroke but we know we thrombolize minor strokes also so I told her very straightforward very respectfully madam this is this thing uh, it should be thrombolized some people don't thrombolize but we would like to thrombolize because it is but you will have to sign it she quietly signed and the patient became totally all right also and the and and and, and better than that anecdote is in. You know, this thrombolysis, it, it took us 10 years to get DCGI approval in our country. But uh, TPA came in 2000 only. It was at the time marketed by German remedies. And German remedies were not even interested in promoting it. They did nothing. I mean, they're unlike MCURE, which is moving earth, earth and sky to get it 4.5 hours and all. German remedies didn't bother about it. We had to go to Bombay and get it and all. And it was already given in DCGI for approval. It took five years for DCGI to approve. Now, during somewhere in 2001 or 2002, some DCGI senior person, I think he was vice president or something, his mother got a stroke and she was brought to our hospital and she was in window period. And I told her that there is one drug uh, which can be given, but it has not been approved by you as yet. So should I give it or not? <laughs> <laughs> but I did not. I mean, I was not mean. I told him very sympathetically. But it is working, it is working all over the world. But there are some bureaucratic problems here. It will take some time. He said, Doctor, go ahead and give it. I said, Then please sign it. He signed it. He signed for an unapproved drug by his department. And uh, but it is always better to take a signature. Okay, thank you, sir. Apologies for that. Thank you, sir. But in but suppose if there is no attendant, if the you know that also happens sometimes. People are got from the factory. You see, I, I think one of the things which I have learned over the course of time, we should always think for the best interest of the patient. We should not go so much for, you know, we have to think of our safety also and patient's outcome also. I mean, we should practice medicine really in a sincere way, not absolutely defensive and not offensive at all. So it can happen sometimes and it has happened with me. That's why I'm telling you. A patient is brought from a factory with a stroke and there are 10 workers. And nobody is taking responsibility of giving TPA. At that time, I have thrombolized. I have written no family member available. Uh, the office workers not given consent, but it's in the best interest of patient to give thrombolysis. I've given thrombolysis. I can justify it in any court of law. Nobody signed, but I still gave it. I signed for him. So that thing can happen sometimes, but you know, you have to know your signs and why you are doing. So there are situations where we may not need consent, where we will not. Thank you, sir. I think we have spent a lot of time in this discussion. We can go to next.